Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. A church here in the upper room service and um, those uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, those in the church sanctuary, you might notice the background is somewhat different because we are not in the performing uh, arts theatre this morning. We are in the auditorium, right? And the reason for that is because our Filipino sisters and maybe some brothers, right, the service, they are having their 40th anniversary, right? Today, let's praise the Lord. Yeah, we give thanks for what He has done um, in the lives and through the lives of our, especially our sisters in, in the ministry. Uh, and we pray that the Lord will continue to bless them, establish the work of His hands, and that many lives um, will be saved through this ministry. Come, let us pray. O God of creation, Lord of revelation, as your people, Park Road Methodist Church, gather on this hill, reveal to us your grace, reveal to us your truth. Above all, reveal to us yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and God's people say, Amen. How do you respond when you hear news of a disaster or a tragedy? A 38-year-old woman goes jogging in a park at Marceline. A 20-meter tall tree falls and pins her underneath. Passers-by tried to help, but they could not lift the tree. Hours, an hour later, the woman dies. At a luxury shopping mall in Bangkok, a 14-year-old teenager with a handgun fires randomly at a clueless crowd. He kills two and injures five before being disarmed. How do you respond when you hear news like this? A week ago, a series of strong earthquakes struck the western part of Afghanistan. According to Taliban officials, more than 3,000 people were killed. Yes, 3,000, that's the entire membership of our church. And right now, as we all know, a war is raging in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. Thousands have died Hundreds of thousands have been made homeless. Hostages have been taken. Children have been gunned down. Women have been raped. The world, already made unstable by the Russia-Ukraine conflict, is facing the greatest crisis since the Second World War. How do you respond how do we respond when we read and watch news of these disasters and calamities? Some of us actually are not at all bothered by the above. We have enough troubles of our own. We have bills to pay, a family to raise, tasks to complete. The year is coming to an end. This is the time where exams are underway, holidays are planned, Christmas shopping has begun. What has all this news about people dying and suffering in lands far away has to do with us? But then again, not everyone who watches the news respond with such disinterest or apathy. Many can't help but ask, why, when we see others suffer? Deep inside, we wonder why they have to suffer terrible things and we don't have to. Why we are spared. We feel a sense of relief, but also guilt for feeling relieved. 
And at times we come to the simplistic conclusion that these people who are suffering and dying deserve what has befallen them. And this was exactly what happened in our text today. They were present at that season, some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, this was the same Pilate who later gave permission for Jesus to be crucified. Ancient records tell us that Pilate was known for being a cruel ruler. And so this account is consistent with history. And apparently, Pilate had murdered these Galileans while they were offering sacrifices at the temple. It is likely that these Galileans had offended this governor, Pilate, or were part of an anti-government movement. In any case, Jesus gave those who asked him or told him about new, the news an unexpected reply. He said, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. And just in case some of them still felt that the Galileans were responsible for their own suffering and their deaths, Jesus pointed, Jesus gave them another piece of headline news at that time. Those 18 on those on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. Certainly, no one should attribute the falling of a tower to the sins of those who happen to be under it. Twice, twice, Jesus would, un would answer, no, these people were not worse sinners just because terrible things happened to them. In other words, all of you today, here, you know, he tells his hearers, all of you, it is not because that you are less of a sinner that you are alive. Now, taking a step back, I wonder, those who told Jesus about this news, what were they hoping Jesus to say? You know, what were they hoping to hear as they told Jesus about Pilate and the Galileans? Were they hoping to hear Jesus' opinion on Pilate and his political actions? Or Jesus' advice on whether Jews should resist the Roman Empire? Or as mentioned, did they want to hear Jesus' view on why God allowed these Galileans to be massacred. Whatever their reasons, it seems that these watchers of the news, of the Jerusalem news, it seems that they, they were seeking to distance themselves from those who were suffering and dying. But no, says Jesus, what is happening to these people has direct relevance for your life. The things that are happening to those suffering in disasters, in tragedies, has direct relevance to your life. For unless you repent, you too will perish. Unless you repent, you too will perish. Please don't distance yourselves from the suffering of others. And don't for a moment imagine that just because nothing terrible has happened to you, it means that you are a decent person or that God is happy with the way you are living your life. The fact that you, you seem to be having an easy life is no indication that you are blessed. You can check that out, for example, in Psalm 73. 
which depicts wicked people seemingly having a blessed life. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. It is interesting that in the preceding sections, um, that is in Luke 12, 54 to 59, Jesus speaks about the need to interpret and to discern wisely, right? The need to interpret and discern wisely what we see around us. For example, Luke 12, 56 to 57. Hypocrites, Jesus said, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this present time? And why do you not judge for yourself what is right? Jesus is saying, look around you, watch the news, see what's happening near and far. Discern the times, judge correctly. Ask yourselves, should I change the way I see and perceive things? And if so, how might I live differently in the light of what I now see? For there will come a time for reckoning, a time for reckoning and accountability. There will come a time when the owner of the vineyard will be looking for fruit. And this is why Jesus continues with a parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But the keeper or the gardener answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it, fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well. But if not, you can cut it down. Unless you repent, you too will perish. Unless you bear fruit, you too will be cut down. God is very serious about what happens inside of us, more than what is happening around us. You know, there's probably not very much we can do about the atrocities committed by dictators or disasters reported in the news every day. But there is something we can do about our own selfishness, our own greed, our own lack of love. There is much we can do for others who are victims or are victimized, those who are unfortunate or marginalized. The barren fig tree, does this describe our lives right now? Are we also using up the ground, consuming the nutrients of the soil, expanding the resources of the earth, and all this while giving out nothing except carbon dioxide? Have I become a fruitless fig tree? Well, church, we are all living in the fourth year. Right? Remember the parable. The owner came and said that for three years, no fruit. Cut it down. But the gardener said, one more year. Give it one more year. The fourth year. And in case some of us, as we read this parable, wonder, who's the owner? Who's the gardener? You know, if this is God, who's the other one? But do understand when we read parables, we, we don't analyze such things because the parable has one main point. 
But if we really want to identify the characters, then I would say that both the owner and the gardener represents God because God is both judge and father. We are living in the fourth year, a year of grace, a year for repentance, a year in which the Holy Spirit digs around and fertilizes us. He wants to help us. He's determined to save us from the X. The question is, will we let him? It's not going to feel very comfortable when a gardener starts digging up things around us, in us. It might feel really terrible when what seems like dung and manure are being thrown at us as fertilizers. Well, friends, is this how you're feeling right now? That your otherwise decent life is being disturbed and your false sense of peace is being thrown into disarray. Perhaps, just perhaps, this is the work of the gardener who is stirring you, pruning you, and saving you. Instead of becoming resentful, maybe it's time we repent. It is time to finally bear the fruit of repentance. Yes, what John the Baptist called fruits of repentance. Luke chapter 3. Then he said, right, this is John the Baptist, then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from the stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Come, let's read these uh, two other slides together. One, two, three. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, What shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely or be con and be content with your wages. Church, the fourth year won't last forever. Watch the news. See what's happening near and far. Discern the times. 2,000 years after Pilate and Siloam, tyrants continue to murder, towers continue to fall. The fourth year has begun and it is ending soon. The vineyard owner is coming back to visit the fig tree and we pray that he will find figs. Let me conclude. As we watch the news or read about disasters, tragedies, and the Bible tells us that we will see more of this as the end draws near. As we see, as we read about all the terrible things that happen to people near and far, 
What is our first reaction? Is it one of judgment or compassion? Judgment or compassion? Do we tend to distance ourselves from those suffering? Or do we identify, empathize with them as a fellow human being? You know, compassion means to suffer together with. It comes from Latin word, compati, com, with, petty, passion, suffer. To suffer together with compassion. This is how we should respond to the suffering we watch on the news every day. And may I suggest for us to bring home some handers, something that we can do every time we read about a disaster or a tragedy, that we pause, ponder, and pray. Right? Easy. Let's try. We pause, ponder, and pray. First, we pause. We pause as the Lord brings to us, brings to our attention these happenings. Don't be quick to ignore it or to disengage from this news because it has everything to do with us. Don't be distracted when you're reading the news when something important comes out. And no, I... I, I use an app, uh, Straits Times app, to read news, and I get really upset when I'm reading something important and then the next thing goes Adidas, you know, or Amazon, or cheap flights to Perth. You know, then you can't be, then you, you kind of like feel like looking at it, and sometimes you do get distracted from something really important by something totally insignificant. But that's how it is. In this world, let us understand that every suffering that God brings to our attention demands a response, even if it's just a moment of silence or just paying attention, pausing at that very moment to consider, to ponder, which is our second point. Pause, ponder, ask. What does it mean for those who suffer and for me? Ponder, but do not interpret what we see with simplistic conclusions. For example, that those who suffer must have sinned greatly. You know, when you see a plane crash, 100 people die, Sometimes intuitively we must say, oh, these people must be sinners. That's why they all died this way. No. Jesus calls us, corrects us. No, do not think this way. If we must judge, judge ourselves, lest we be judged. Ponder, ask. Let the suffering of others touch our spirit and confront our own soul. Pause, ponder, and pray. Let our compassion drive us to prayer. Yes, to prayer. Do not ignore, do not disengage. Give attention and pray even if it's just a short but sincere prayer for those who are suffering. Pray and perhaps if you have an opportunity, do something about it. Act, give, participate. As God calls us to be sought and liked, and a blessing in this world. 
And so pause, ponder, and pray. This is how we respond with compassion in an increasingly troubled and broken world. You know, if you know, the vineyard owner, he was looking for a fruit. Is there a specific fruit that he was looking for? Of course, he was looking for figs. But what kind of figs? You know, if I were to guess, I would say he was looking for compassion. He was looking for compassion. Finally, we must ask, why are we often tempted to judge others as worse sinners than ourselves? Are we not aware of our own weaknesses and our need for mercy? It is difficult to have compassion on others when we do not realize the condition of our own hearts. It is hard to be kind to others if we don't understand how much God's kindness has been shown to us. Remember, God gave the barren fig tree one more year that it might repent and bear fruit. The fruit of love, peace, patience, kindness, the fruit of compassion. Jesus says, unless you repent, you too will perish. Today, the Lord is calling us to go and exercise compassion Compassion to your family members, your spouse, your children, your parents, your siblings. The Lord is asking us to exercise compassion in our schools or our workplace, to our colleagues, our subordinates, even our boss. Exercise compassion even on the roads as you drive, in the hawker centre, in the food courts. Stop pointing the finger. When others fail, when others fall, when others make mistakes, let us not overreact. Let us not judge. Instead, let us show mercy and compassion. For Jesus did not come to save the righteous, but sinners like you, like me. Amen.